Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Happy solstice, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to uh, ITIF's webinar on carbon border adjustment mechanisms. My name is David Hart. I am the director of the Center for Clean Energy Innovation at ITIF, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. ITIF is a think tank that is a nonpartisan, a nonprofit research organization that focuses on policy issues. Uh, clean energy innovation is one of several uh, that span the range of science and technology policy uh, topics. Um, we were formerly called the uh, Clean Energy Innovation Program, so we have a new name, a new logo, but we're still producing the same high quality research, uh, which you'll get a bit of a taste of today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stefan Koster. Uh, Stefan is a senior policy analyst here at ITIF, and he joined uh, us in May. Um, he holds a couple of master's degrees from Tufts, where he worked with the Climate Policy Lab, among other things. And uh, this is his maiden voyage um, in ITIF webinars. Uh, but we'll, uh, we're expecting it to be the first of many, and it's been great fun to uh, have him around. So Stefan is going to share uh, our report, of which I'm a co-author, uh, along with Grace Sly. And when Stefan concludes, uh, Ben Garside uh, will introduce the panel and serve as the moderator. Uh, ben joins us from London, I believe, um, where he is the co-founder and director of Carbon Pulse. Carbon Pulse is a specialized news source on um, climate and uh, energy issues. And uh, Ben has a background in journalism, previously covered climate change for Reuters, among other things. And with that, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please add your questions to the Slido. Uh, there'll be plenty of time at the end of the discussion for the panel to address audience questions. And um, uh, with that, I will kick it over to Stefan. Thanks, David. All right. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to uh, our European friends and colleagues. And thank you all so much for joining us uh, today. Again, my name is Stefan Koster, and I'm a senior policy analyst here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Um, I also want to take a moment just to thank the other two author co-authors, David, who you just heard from, and, and Grace Sly. Um, so today we'll be discussing um, our recently published report that looks critically at the intersection of trade, international climate policy and cooperation, and climate technology innovation. We're joined by a wonderful panel that will help us unpack these issues and consider what are the workable steps going forward to foster ambitious climate policies to spur much needed clean tech deployment. Um, so let's just jump right into it. So uh, I want to begin uh, with uh, looking at the problems that carbon border tariffs, also sometimes known as carbon border adjustment mechanisms or CBAMs, as we'll refer to them uh, going forward. So what problems CBAMs are trying to solve for? Um, as we know, climate change is a global problem. One ton of CO2 emitted within one country's borders has the same climate impact as one ton of CO2 emitted in any other country. The carbon emissions embodied in the trade of goods are actually quite significant, with the OECD estimating that as much as 25% of global emissions are embodied in international trade flows. Economic theory suggests that countries with carbon prices or strict environmental regulations impose a cost on their industries, with those cost spurring efforts to innovate ways to reduce emissions. However, in a globalized trading system where one country's energy intensive and trade exposed industries such as steel or cement, fertilizer, face an environmental cost and another nation's industries do not, there are competitive pressures on those industries to avoid environmental costs, leading to the potential for carbon leakage uh, in the form of shifting production from more environmentally stringent jurisdictions to less environmentally stringent jurisdictions. So a carbon border tariff or CBAM is essentially the application of an internal carbon price to imports from jurisdictions without complementary uh, costs. Um, and the idea being that this will uh, level the playing field and can protect against uh, carbon leakage. So we at ITIF are always interested in how a specific set of policies affects uh, the much needed innovation pipeline. Uh, for clean energy technologies, especially those, especially those needed to decarbonize energy intensive trade exposed industries. We know that there's a lot of technological development and deployment needed to meet uh, climate targets. Um, we see trade alongside the many other tools in the climate policy toolbox as, as critical to fostering innovation. Trade policy supports technological innovation through economies of scale, access to wider or specialized markets, 
It keeps companies competitively sharp through the pressures of global competition. And trade can lead to the possible creation of clusters and industrial hubs, uh, such as what we're seeing in uh, with, hydro with green hydrogen in the North Atlantic or emergence of a CCS hub in the Texas Gulf Coast area. Uh, the quintessential example of this technological innovation uh, and deployment cost curves is probably solar PV over the last 40 years. And the question for other needed clean techs is how to create an international trade regime that will ensure similar benefits across a broad suite of technologies. And ultimately, we see that without a global carbon price or strict global cooperation on climate and trade, which we're unlikely to see, we're likely to continue in, to exist um, in a world where dirty but cheap continually undercuts uh, clean but expensive alternatives. So for many of you who have been following this space, you know that carbon prices and borders have been a persistent concern of policymakers throughout the years. Uh, in fact, almost every single piece of carbon pricing legislation introduced to Congress since the 1990s has included some kind of uh, border protection language. Uh, most recently, actually, in the United States, Senator Chris Coons of Delaware introduced the Fair, Affordable, Innovative, and Resilient Transition and Competition Act, which would essentially impose a carbon import fee on carbon intensive products. I think uh, notably this legislation is not included alongside a national carbon pricing policy, rather it's sort of to complement our regulatory um, and tax credit approach. So the EU has been toying with this idea as well, um, and this is in order to complement their emissions trading scheme. And uh, they formally introduced a proposal in July of this year that represents probably the most concrete carbon adjustment proposal to date. Uh, unsurprisingly, reaction from global trading partners uh, was swift and critical. Russia's energy minister is quoted as saying uh, this, that this may clash with global trade rules and threaten the safety of energy supplies. China's foreign minister said the CBAM is essentially a unilateral measure to extend the climate change issue to the trade sector. It violates WTO principles and will undermine mutual trust in the global community and the prospects for economic growth. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry said that uh, a CBAM is premature to be discussing whether or not you ought to go off and unilaterally, let, unilaterally do a CBAM. Um, and Australia's prime minister is on record saying that CBAMs run the risk of enhancing protectionism, and that I think would be detrimental to global growth, to free trade globally. CBAMs are simply trade protectionism by another name. Pardon me. And I think most notably um, that uh, the European, uh, the EU based industries that a CBAM is ostensibly meant to level the playing field for, such as steel and cement, their trade associations have actually come out in opposition to the CBAM, instead of preferring the status quo. So, briefly, how is a CBAM likely to work and what are some of its potential pitfalls? Uh, simply put, a CBAM works by applying a reciprocal carbon tariff on the carbon content of imported goods equal to the price paid by domestic producers to produce those same goods. Some proposals do include uh, an export rebate for domestic producers to jurisdictions lacking a carbon price, leveling the playing field for domestic exporters and international importers. And yet, while this simplifies uh, the policy's many nuances, we've identified a number of challenges and drawbacks that we see with the implementation of any real-world CBAM. First, we think that counting and independently verifying the carbon content for manufactured products will be extremely difficult for a number of reasons. Uh, individual firms, individual plants have very diverse production processes, different fuel mixes based on local conditions and economics, and varying emissions intensities for their electric grid. Some producers are blessed with easy access to transportation hubs, while others have to ship their products in more emissions intensive ways. So using a national average that treats all firms and plants as equal dampens as incentives for product innovation for lower carbon processes. A system by which individual producers can prove their lower carbon intensity will undoubtedly add some complexity, confusion, fears of favoritism and miscalculation on the part of accounting authorities. And ultimately, we believe that the system opens itself up to put the potential for political manipulation that will undermine the support or long-term certainty of the program. In addition, setting prices in a world with a cap and trade regime has the potential to fluctuate widely, um, where prices fluctuate widely for allowances. And this makes it potentially difficult for importing firms to predict costs and may undermine long-term decarbonization investment. 
CBAMs are also ill-fitted to account for the cost of non-direct pricing climate and energy policies, something that we see as a serious hurdle to supporting an international climate negotiation system that is predicated on a bottom-up approach. In the US, for example, where we are unlikely to have a national carbon price anytime soon, but rather rely upon regulatory standards, clean energy to credits, energy RD&D, we think it'd be fairly difficult to accurately price in all of those policies and to calculate a CBAM that reflects those very real costs that US producers face. We think that the risk of indirect carbon leakage or where importers attempt to circumvent a CBAM by shipping finished products rather than raw materials is very real and would undermine the economic and environmental rationale for CBAMs. And it's still very much an open question as to how CBAMs square with existing WTO trade rules. We've already seen from the quotes that I read earlier, some countries raise this objection to the EU proposal. And there are serious concerns that CBAMs are, quote, Ma uh, protectionism masquerading as climate policy. Ultimately, we think it'll be years before we have any kind of definite answer from the uh, WTO appellate body as well. We feel that CBAMs don't recognize the difference in uh, national economic trajectories, nor do they respect the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities. And this runs the risk of undermining hard fought gains in the international climate sphere. By treating developed and least developed nations equally, a CBAM runs the risk of penalizing countries that essentially bear little historic responsibility for climate change. So we feel that CBAMs, no matter how well administered, are an incomplete system for driving climate innovation. That's because in sectors such as iron and steel and cement, where the marginal cost of abatement is very high, a CBAM tariff would simply increase the market price and shut out competitors. Demand would likely decline, but emissions per unit would likely change very little. All this would have the effect of stymieing climate innovation while not providing the necessary incentives to spur investment in technologies that reduce emissions in hard to abate sectors. A CBAM uh, worryingly could result in global segmentation in which we have clean and dirty blocks of nations which only trade amongst themselves or even subnational segmentation Say a manufacturer splits its production into dirty and clean corporate entities with the dirty entity trading with non-CBAM countries while the cleaner entity trades with CBAM countries. Of course, this does nothing to reduce emissions and likely dampens incentives to innovate and deploy lower carbon industrial technologies and processes. All this corporate energy and investment that ought to be going into reducing industrial emissions ultimately goes into devising ways of gaming the global system of CBAM enactment and enforcement. So in the paper, we propose an alternative uh, to national CBAMs um, and see this alternative as a means of spurring international cooperation and hopefully continued innovation while help helping to keep out dirty players. Uh, so we believe that a voluntary multinational club-based approach that respects diverse national interests and policies while fostering cooperation and engagement amongst club members is preferable um, to a system of reciprocating national carbon border tariffs where each country has their, their own national uh, carbon tariff. So our idea borrows from Build Nordhaus's uh, climate club approach. It includes sort of the carrots of liberalized trade with an innovation with the stick of trade tariffs and ex possible exclusion from the club. In addition, we think a club-based approach is better suited to diverse climate strategies that nations are likely to adopt and can work to spur increased ambition on the part of countries outside the club with the incentive of being able to join. Uh, here's how it works or how we outline it in the paper briefly. So like-minded countries such as say the United States, the European Union, the UK, Canada, South Korea, perhaps Japan, would get together and establish a list of criteria for entry into the club. In the paper, we present a non-exhaustive list including a credible net zero plan, either a carbon price or robust and well-enforced regulatory policies that reduce emissions, tax incentives to support emerging clean energy technologies, sustained national RD&D spending. In the paper, we suggest a threshold of 0.04% of GDP. Commitments from national corporate entities, uh, especially industrial en and energy intensive ones to invest in and reduce emissions by 2050. A robust national accounting, carbon accounting and verification process. The nations would then agree to not impose any carbon-based tariffs on imports from countries within the club while supporting broad flat tariffs or quotas for imports for, uh, from non-club members.
that being the incentive for those non-club members to meet the criteria and hopefully join the, the climate club. So we uh, ultimately we see the club's purpose as uh, one that can lower transaction costs, increase ambition, speed hopefully speed policy adoption and avoid antagonistic and purely protectionist policies. It'll provide an incentive for energy innovation and avoid punishing producers at the margin, which we feel does little to increase climate investment. And a climate club would also work to reduce trade frictions among club members and could be designed to accommodate least developed nations and to respect the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, finally, a climate club could drive increasingly ambitious national climate targets where nations strive to increase the stringency uh, of their climate policies in order to join. Just to wrap it up, um, while we see an economy-wide club as probably the preferable option, as it covers more sectors and more sources of emissions, we understand that the potential realities of multilateral negotiations make it difficult to start with the broadest and most ambitious policy option. We consider the possibility of starting with a sectoral climate club and building that into a broader economy-wide approach. This idea uh, of a clean steel club has been floating around um, amongst the, commun the environmental community, and it would have sort of a similar outline and framework as an economy-wide approach, but it would be just limited to the iron and steel sectors. We see the benefits of starting small are that there are fewer veto points in the negotiations, there's an alignment of interests in both limiting trade friction and hopefully spurring investment in emission reduction technologies. And it can keep out polluting non-club members while protecting domestic producers from unfair competition from places that don't have strict carbon pricing or enforceable climate and regulatory policies. Again, club members uh, could set equivalent public uh, clean steel procurement standards uh, to, to create conditions for increased demand and expanded markets for clean steel products from within the club members. And the clean steel club members would all would be encouraged to collaborate, hopefully on national cross-national pilot and demonstration programs, and could outline rules for expanding into least developed nations to help them reduce their steel industry carbon uh, intensity. And finally, uh, we see kind of the, uh, the EU-US Section 232 steel tariff negotiations. We see this as a potential starting place where negotiators can lay out further criteria and guardrails to develop a clean steel climate innovation club while working to overcome persistent trade tensions and stem the overcapacity concerns in the global steel market, which we know have huge environmental emissions impacts. In addition, we see the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow this November to be a critical moment in which trade and climate concerns are going to meet head on. And we believe that the development of a clean steel club might provide an opening for constructive negotiations on developing ambitious climate policies while hopefully helping to cool down some of these ongoing trade frictions. And with that, I just want to wrap up, encourage folks to check out our report. And um, we have an infographic which sort of has all this information on one uh, handy page. Um, and I'll send it over to our wonderful moderator and panel. So we'll do about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll set it up for, open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stefan. Thanks for that uh, and a very interesting report that you guys have, have put out. Um, I'd like to um, thank the audience for joining us, uh, whatever time of day it is, wherever you're listening. Um, my name is Ben Garside. I'm the director and uh, one of the co-founders of Carbon Pulse. Um, we're a specialist news agency that looks at uh, climate policy and carbon pricing around the world. Um, uh, before we continue, yeah, um, I'd like to remind you that you can submit your questions via the Slido application. Uh, that's on the event page or on the Slido link uh, that you'll see in the YouTube description. Um, okay, that being said, let's get on with our discussion. Uh, we've heard from Stefan, so I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, joining us, we have uh, Maureen Hinman, she, the co-founder and executive chair for the Silverado Policy Accelerator, which is a nonprofit focused on advancing American prosperity and global leadership in the 21st century and beyond. Uh, she's the former director for the Environment and Natural Resources at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and she's also served at the U.S. Department of Commerce's Senior Industry Trade Specialist. Uh, also joining us is Sam Lowe, uh, a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform. Uh, he's also visiting senior Re research fellow at the Policy Institute, King's College London, and co-founder of the UK Trade Forum. He was previously a member of the British government's Strategic Trade Advisory Group. 
And finally, we have Sarah Ladislaw, Managing Director at RMI, a nonprofit uh, comprised of experts working to accelerate the clean energy transition and to improve lives. She also works on uh, other global initiatives such as the Mission Possible Partnership. And Sarah was previously Senior Vice President and Director of the Energy, Security and Climate Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Okay, so we're gonna hear some opening remarks from our panelists and then we will be able to take your questions uh, after that. We should have plenty of time for that. Um, so yeah, I think first that we have Maureen, uh, your, your reaction, please. Thanks so much, Ben, I appreciate it. So just to set the table a little bit, I think we need to start by acknowledging that the United States and the European Union have a number of shared interests in the climate space, including setting and meeting more ambitious goals, guiding decarbonization of our economies in a manner that delivers on jobs and improves overall welfare of our citizens, adapting to the current realities of climate change, right-sizing international institutions for new global challenges, including climate change and adaptation, and addressing international climate and environmental free riders. Um, the recent EU-US announcement of shared methane uh, reduction, emissions reductions to 2030 by 30% is, uh, as an, uh, underscores that dynamic. We're also the two largest global markets for environmental goods and services. We invest heavily in environmental compliance, and we both have stringent uh, environmental regulations and control mechanisms that yield demonstrable outcomes in carbon pollution reduction. We are like and like-minded, and I would argue that there are strong incentives at this juncture to cooperate and jointly lead on global commons issues, including climate, trade, and security. Um, in the absence of that shared leadership, I have grave concerns for the future of the rules uh, sort of based world order. Uh, and um, sort of despite this shared uh, interest in climate, I have legitimate fears that the United States and the EU on the matter of carbon border adjustment specifically are about to fall into an old and ineffective pattern of multi-year squabbling and dispute on the technical differences between our respective systems despite sharing the same broad objectives and having roughly equal outcomes. Um, so turning to carbon border adjustment policies specifically, I think we have to start by asking ourselves what are the legitimate objectives of these policies and what um, mechanisms are effective in serving these legitimate objectives without being excessively trade restrictive. Um, simply, the objective of a carbon border measure is to level the playing field on carbon output for intensive sectors. Uh, the EU has stated that its objective is to encourage cleaner production. The focus of these measures are necessarily on countries without measures comparative in effectiveness, and in particular on those that utilize lower environmental standards as a form of competitive advantage. Um, border adjustment itself can be achieved a couple of different ways either through a carbon price, regulatory mechanisms, or a combination of the two. Trade remedies could also be utilized here, um, where environmental arbitrage is treated as a subsidy and countervailed. However, one thing that does not change is that, as at its heart, border measures are designed to equate differences in manufactured carbon output. And that, whether based on a rule or a carbon price, is borne through the cost of compliance and is measured by the comparative carbon output. Now, um, turning to the draft EU law, the Commission has proposed what it is a fairly elaborate methodology requiring regular assessment of duties at the firm level with third party validation. In effect, these would be dynamic tariffs that would introduce a level of uncertainty in markets that in the wake of supply chain fractures and shortages, I don't think the world or the United States and the EU need. The mechanism would be complicated and costly for businesses to comply with, and also difficult for government to administer, and frankly, a waste of administrative resources on markets that are like and like-minded. Furthermore, um, measures that are excessively trade restrictive to meet legitimate objectives are going to be vulnerable to WTO challenge. If the EU expectation is coherence in the form of a US price for carbon, that outcome is unlikely and ultimately unnecessary to meet legitimate objectives. To be defensible, the US system does not have to be the same. It only has to be comparative in effectiveness. This is where the carbon output of manufacturing comes in because unless there is a carbon, genera carbon generation in excess of what is produced domestically, the measure automatically breaches the threshold for what is considered comparable in effectiveness and therefore is excessively trade restrictive. So using the example as a steel sector, 
um, you know, carbon, uh, the carbon intensity of a, of a basic oxygen furnace is, is roughly the same for, for France and um, uh, with the U.S. outperforming uh, Germany and Italy and uh, frankly blowing Poland out of the water. Poland produces almost a ton more carbon per ton of steel than the United States does in, in, in blast arc uh, in, 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 uh, in BOF furnaces. Uh, similarly for electric arc furnaces, which make up the bulk of the U.S. fleet, uh, the U.S. is on par with, with Italy, but again, Germany, uh, the United States outperforms Germany and outperforms Poland, um, by, and it is outperforming Poland by about 350 kilograms of CO2 um, uh, per ton of steel, respectively. Um, where these differences exist, the EU is in no position to levy a border tax on U.S. firms. Um, but, you know, the EU law, uh, I think, would be more appropriately remedied uh, to include um, uh, language that either equalizes the cost for carbon or provides an out for countries that have systems that are comparable in effectiveness. Uh, I think that those measures would be welcomed by the international community and would serve legitimate objectives of, of, uh, of trying to promote cleaner um, uh, uh, production, especially in, in dirtier sectors like steel. Um, in the absence of that, the EU is is uh, not only saying that it has the right to tax imports without meeting um, the burden of comparable effectiveness, um, it, it also is challenging the U.S. right to regulate because it insinuates that the EU has a right to determine whether the U.S. regulates carbon through a price or a rule. Um, sovereigns don't have the, the right to uh, establish regulatory objectives for other so sovereigns, nor do they have the right to establish regulatory mechanisms for other sovereigns. Um, to take this a step further, um, not only would this system uh, tax U.S. companies, um, but it would form, um, it would impose a, a level of firm uh, a regulatory oversight on U.S. operations that uh, really isn't isn't a border measure. It's a behind the border measure. Um, so, if, uh, just to, to kind of summarize, rather than squabbling over negligible differences in carbon output in our steel industries, I think the EU and the US would be better served coordinating on important matters in the steel industry, like you know what we're going to do about the economic and environmental impacts of steel overcapacity. Um, more broadly in border adjustment, what we're, are we going to do uh, about uh, state-directed uh, economies that use environmental arbitrage as a, um, a point of competitiveness and uh, drive a, a global race to the bottom in a variety of sectors? Um, there is a real risk of, of getting mired in dispute. I, I think that would be foolhardy. Uh, I think there's also real opportunity for the U.S. and the EU to lead the world into the next century on climate. Um, my husband loves to comment that in marriage you can be right or you can be happy. Um, I think there is an analog here and um, I hope that we all choose happiness. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Maureen. Really interesting to hear your remarks. Um, I'm looking forward to um, progressing this discussion, discussion to find really if there's, um, if there's anyone coming out strongly in favor of a carbon border adjustment measure. Um, I suspect even the people that wrote it in the EU aren't too fond of it, but um, we'll see. Um, yeah, so, so speaking next, we have um, Sam Lowe. Sam? Uh, thank you very much, and, and, and th thank you for inviting me, and thank you for writing uh, this very interesting paper. Uh, uh, I share quite a few of your criticisms of the design of the CBAM, and especially around the compliance costs and I'm particularly interested in some of the points you made around indirect carbon leakage so whereby uh, producers that aren't necessarily caught by the measure for example the car industry end up offshoring their production so as to take advantage of dirtier steel that would have been caught uh, if imported into the EU territory and also and also the gaming of the system we've already heard a bit of this from the Russian producers sending their clean stuff to the EU and their dirty stuff elsewhere although I would push back slightly on some on some of some, some of your critiques so, 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 so you're saying well circumvention will become a big issue circumvention is already a big problem in the trade system when it comes to trade remedies you get chinese firms trying to dodge anti-dumping uh, duties all the time the eu just had to put duties on aluminium imported from thailand because they suspected that it was chinese steel so, so that's something the trade authorities are already quite well versed uh, in dealing with so i don't see that being such a big 
issue. But but Ben, you just asked for someone to put forward the case for a CBAM, and I'm going to do so tentatively, or at least I'm just going to provide a bit of context for the EU's uh, proposal and 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 sort of argue why a CBAM matters uh, in that event. And, and and the context is that the EU already has a very high carbon price sort of emissions trading permits are trading at what around 60 euros a ton at the moment and it also has all of the regulatory measures and probably to a more stringent degree than most of the US because this is the bit that always gets missed in the discussion when people are saying well you should be able to account for the US regulatory measures too and the implicit carbon price they place on production well yes I actually agree with that but if you were to do that in the EU as well you would actually be facing a much higher carbon price and in terms of what you had to navigate when importing into the EU and the effective levy at the border in the case of it being applied as part of an adjustment mechanism and but the the actual reason this proposal exists is not really anything to do with the outside world it's because the EU has to negotiate with itself and in order to bring everyone on board on its net zero agenda, its climate ambition within the EU. So the Polands of the world, the Germanys of the world, places with lots of manufacturing, lots of high carbon production. The commission had to be able to answer the question, what about carbon leakage? So this proposal to me isn't really a trade instrument. It's a political economy instrument that's focused domestically within the EU and it's designed to create the political space necessary to sign off all the other things the EU wants to do in the climate space. And in a, in a sense, with those things having now been signed off or being close to being signed off in, in, in the new package, even if it never actually comes into existence, the CBAM that is, maybe it's done its job if it's got everyone to sign off everything else. And I think that sometimes gets missed in the discussion and and it's because everyone focuses on well maybe they are actually trying to level the playing field maybe they are looking outwards no it's just an insular debate that unfortunately has uh, international implications but uh, but the point you've made that i do think is a really important one is the com- fixed compliance cost associated with the eu's proposal and this is down to the fact that if you are importing CBAM goods into the EU, you now have to register with this relevant national authority. You have to account for the embedded emissions in the product. You have to purchase CBAM certificates. You then have to surrender them at the end of the year. You know, this is expensive just from an administrative point of view, because my view is that over time, of course, you would hope that the actual cost of the CBAM becomes negligible as every other country uh, introduces its own carbon pricing mechanisms or regulatory mechanisms that can be accounted for uh, uh, when companies document the the carbon embedded within their uh, production. But the fixed compliance cost remains, and that's obviously friction we don't want. So I think a lot more focus should be given on reducing the cost of compliance. And this can be by, for example, using more reasonable benchmarks that companies can use if they don't actually have the capacity to account for the carbon embedded within all of their imports. This could be SME support. This could be in the form of exemptions for least developed uh, countries. And to get to my third point, well, I'm going to talk about the proposal of what I effectively view as a carbon customs union, which is the idea of a carbon club. And when you just and you import, import, impose a tariff on everyone uh, exporting from outside of it. But, the, but before I get to that, just one aside I want to make is when I'm talking about the EU-US relationship here, we should just remember that based on the existing CBAM proposal, the US is hardly affected at all. It's not even in the top 10 most exposed countries if you're looking at the products listed and trade flows from 2019. In terms of countries more exposed than the US, I'm just having a look at it here, you've got You've got uh, the UAE, you've got Serbia and Montenegro, you've got Mon- Mozambique, you've got Egypt. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be such a big deal in terms of the US-EU trade relationship. And if, if we're talking about the products actually affected aluminium and steel, the main issue there at the moment is the tariffs that are being levied on them. But in terms of the proposal you've put forward of, of a sort of climate car- club, carbon customs union, my, my query there is you've pointed to the potential WTO issues associated with the EU CBAM proposal and I would agree that it's probably going to be challenged I would suggest that even if it faces a challenge it will not necessarily lead to it being removed it would just lead to it being tweaked but but doesn't that issue exist even more so 
in a cu carbon customs union type uh, scenario whereby you are imposing an arbitrary tariff above probably the country's MFN commitments on imports into the carbon customs union from outside with no justification. At least, you know, in the CBAM, you're saying, well, we're just applying uh, the EU's argument is that it's just applying a regulatory cost uh, that's faced, uh, that domestic uh, producers face to uh, Im imports. So it's just an extension of a domestically focused measure. It's not in and of itself discriminatory. Whereas in a carbon customs union, that absolutely would be discriminatory. You'd just be imposing an arbitrary tariff on everything from outside. So I'm just unsure. I'd like to, a bit more discussion on why that is perceived to be uh, more likely to be WTO compliant than, than the CBAM proposal. And I'll leave it there. Great stuff, Sam, in defence of the EU measure. Interesting stuff. OK, um, finally, um, we have some um, opening responses from uh, Sarah Ladislaw from RMI. Sarah? Great. Thanks so much. And uh, congratulations again to ITIF for another very timely, very thoughtful uh, interjection in this ongoing debate about how we accelerate innovation to be able to meet our global climate targets. Um, so I think a lot has been said, and I agree with much of it and think there's a lot of fodder for discussion. I think what I want to do is maybe just add three points that might make some uh, complicating dynamics in the discussion a little bit clearer and and land on a place where I do think it requires the kind of proposal that ITIF has put forward here with perhaps uh, a few tweaks to be able to make sure, I think as Sam was saying, um, and even as Maureen was indicating, that we take the opportunity that is presented here, which is to be able to you know motivate the type of positive reaction to uh, the the existence of these uh, border uh, carbon uh, adjustment mechanisms and tariffs uh, that are you know that are presenting themselves and try to do something positive with it um, so uh, on the first basis I will just say I agree with the report that it's messy and in fact when we first sort of you know started talking about carbon border adjustment mechanisms just the sheer mechanics of trying to think about how to you know navigate the reconciliation as Maureen you know very nicely pointed out between the US and the EU systems was just a super complicated morass of things that was very difficult to be able to you know figure out but I do think, to be candid, that they exist for a reason and they have been inevitable as long as we've been unable to put together a globally coherent um, strategy and set of policies that link like to like policies in different countries to one another to be able to alleviate the need for this kind of mechanism. So it's not really surprising. And I think that from a political economy perspective, these border carbon adjustment mechanisms and border tariffs um, have actually long served a role in motivating different markets for clean energy. And I think that that is um, precisely what they're doing uh, right now, not necessarily to an inevitably positive conclusion. Um, I think their concern about protectionism, particularly on the US side, where we don't actually have a nationally coherent climate policy that is clear and easy to understand, certainly as much as uh, it, as is true in the EU, I think there's lots of room for you know real complication and and real sort of protectionism masked uh, as as uh, energy and climate policy in uh, in the U.S. and you know to a certain extent lesser extent I would say in the EU proposal. Um, and so I do think by virtue of that messiness, there is a problem to be solved here. And I would, again, just point out from a political economy perspective, I'm not sure we're going to get around the domestic political need or call for policies like this. And therefore, it does sort of thrust to the fore this question of how we're going to work together. And to be candid, that is my understanding uh, or uh, my, my assumption about why this conversation exists in the first place. Because as countries get deeper into their uh, decarbonization, uh, stories, the unlevel playing field is going to be much harder for um, them to justify domestically. We wrote a whole paper on this uh, about how if, the, if we really are going to need to mobilize domestic political benefits to be able to say uh, countries should act more aggressively in terms of reaching their deep decarbonization goals, then we're going to see far more of these types of conflicts than, uh, than less. 
The second thing I would just push back on slightly is this idea, though, that this is impossibly complicated from a greenhouse gas accounting perspective. I actually think that this is something that we need to spend some time thinking about uh, on, on a broader level, because regardless of how we manage these carbon border adjustment conversations or leakage conversations, we have the reality that the private sector is moving quite quickly in terms of their greenhouse gas accounting capabilities. At RMI, we have a climate intelligence program that is deeply dedicated to sort of bringing uh, those capabilities forward. And what I find really interesting and potentially problematic if it is not uh, sort of addressed is the difference between the type of greenhouse gas accounting uh, that we would see in the private sector in the markets that are going to be subject to these regulation and the way that the regulation uh, uh, sort of dictates the information about the carbon content or the methane content of a particular good or service. And you see this complication sort of thrust to the fore in the FAIR Act in the US, which is basically, you know, hey, you know, Treasury Department, you decide what the the sort of you know content uh, and, and and value of the regulation is. Where at the same time you're going to have these big markets um, developing uh, with private companies that have their own uh, indications of what they think their carbon content is. And so we're going to have to reconcile some of these hard to reconcile uh, um, um, pieces of data and regulation versus market dynamics at some point in time. So I think some of that complication is unavoidable uh, in a way. I would say the last thing I wanted to point out is I, I do think that the, the second proposal put forward by the ITIF study is, um, is really compelling. I think it builds on um, a couple of different things. Uh, one, there's a huge focus on sectors. The Mission Possible Partnership that I'm working on is, you know, a, a, a global compact of different private sector companies that are working to drive down emissions in the seven hard to abate sectors. Um, and I think that it's, it is really important to, to think about the intersection of various sectors and this trade opportunity. Um, we wrote about this at my last job at CSIS in a report that we thought uh, the G20 could take up, uh, I guess, COP is probably a more realistic time frame, but maybe we'll catch the G20 the second time around, which basically asserts that we are going to have to be proactive about thinking about tying together these carbon club concepts with uh, sector-based initiatives. Because when you look at the pathways that first movers or ambitious movers are thinking about for these carbon-based uh, for 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 what uh, for what would drive a green steel uh, uh, initiative or, or even the area of shipping or aviation. These are areas where I I do think that to be able to move as fast as we know as these sectors need to move, there does need to be some sort of trade alignment. So I see the intersection of deep decarbonization at pace to reach a one and a half degree scenario on a global basis, actually requiring us to get into those trade conversations in a very proactive uh, way. I think the first proposal for an, a, an economy-wide innovation cluster, um, I think is is uh, is great, but if we had that, quite frankly, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I think it's very smart to point out that, you know, steel is an opportunity p potentially because at present there is no positive forum for a climate conversation on steel. There are only trade-oriented conversations about border carbon adjustments or tariffs um, as it relates to uh, to steel trade. And I think that this, it, it, that does make steel one of those potential places where um, a, a pilot like this or a model like this could be tested. I would just say, I think if we applied it broadly to the sectors for whom particularly the challenge is about accelerating innovation, not necessarily accelerating diffusion, of, of clean energy technologies, that, um, that that might be a good way of thinking about additional sectors um, to add to trying to pilot this approach. So um, again, just want to say, think it's a great report. think it adds a lot uh, to the discussion and I'm looking forward to further discussion with the panel. Great stuff, here we all are again, nice one. Well, well thank you very much for your views, everybody. It's very interesting to, to really come up to speed initially from, from reading Stefan's report and then, then getting all your reactions to it. Um, I just maybe you'll just um, kick off um, very quickly by by dialing back a little, um, looking at my experience in, in kind of tracking this, this border measure. Um, so uh, this all became real in July with the EU's um, wide-ranging Fit for 55 package. Now, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a legislative proposal. It targets uh, 
only heavy industry and power that are already within the EU's carbon pricing system. So just a few basic heavy industry sectors. Um, and what the EU has said is, is, is a kind of measurement approach. Uh, so, well, first of all, it needs to be uh, made law. And that's, that's uh, a wide discussion among the EU Parliament and all the member states. It's going to take place over a, the next year at minimum. They've just started to pick up that very heavy file right now. Um, and this proposal would only kick in in 2026 and it would phase in very gradually each year until 2036. So half the time uh, it would take for us all the, the time we're supposed to reach net zero if we're to uh, stop uncontrollable warming anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 uh, I'm wondering if 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 we're all overplaying this idea of a carbon border measure as a, a near and present uh, threat. Uh, guys, do you think that this will actually come about? Maybe I, I can I ask that. you, Stefan. Sorry, <laughs> that's poor. <laughs> Stefan, can I ask you that first? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess we've, um, yeah, we've certainly been skeptical of kind of how the European CBAM policy proposal will um, play out uh, in practice, of course, for the, the reasons we've highlighted as well. Um, and but I think a worry as well for us is that this is this that the European Union is trying to go for a first mover sort of a policy first mover advantage here and that then this will lead to subsequent um, essentially um, uh, retaliatory carbon border protectionist measures um, whether that's India or China or the US or Canada maybe the United Kingdom you know as the UK is now um, you know, after they're now out of the EU, so their 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 products ostensibly will be um, will be covered as well. Um, so I guess our fear is that this will blow up into a broader um, a broader trade carbon trade war process that takes away a lot of attention and and investment that should be going uh, elsewhere. Particularly if it's something that isn't going to have a huge either emissions impact or uh, an innovation investment impact, really. Interesting. Um, Maureen, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I just think as a general matter, and, and, and thank you again, Stefan, for having me here. I thought the, the report was spectacular and thoughtful. Just as a general matter, you know, if we look at kind of how EU processes work, they tend to have kind of inertia of their own once they start rolling forward. The fact that this is a draft law means that there was quite a bit of internal work already done. Um, and from my previous experience in government uh, negotiating with the, with the European Union, oftentimes by, some, by the time something meets a, the burden of being a draft, it's, it's, it's a bit of a fait accompli. So, um, you know, I think the, the trade community is reasonable to be a, a little concerned. Uh, ben, I, I, you do make very good points, though, that there is still a, a long way to go with the member states. So I, I do think that this could be a bit of a moving target. But uh, I, I, I do think that the sort of, you know, institutional uh, inertia is that means that this could this could move forward uh, a, a little bit faster than we anticipate. Okay, um, Sam, you were looking to respond. Well, well, well just to say that I, I do think the proposal will change. You know, so, so the European Parliament will try and make it even more complicated and apply to even more things. You know, they will try and get expand it to apply to agriculture, which doesn't have a domestic carbon price within the EU, but they would just like to see more tariffs on, right? So, so there's going to be that. And then some of the member states are going to try and water it down a bit. If you can see at the moment it applies to electricity, you could see that being stripped out, right? Because some member states are much more dependent on imported electricity uh, from potentially polluting countries than than, than others. So, so, so it will change. But to, to the point of are we focusing on this too too much, I'd just like to reiterate the point I made in, in my initial comments, that if you view the carbon border adjustment mechanism as a trade mechanism designed to change behaviour abroad, well, the, the impacts of this aren't going to be felt for years, because even once it comes into effect, in the first few years, it's just you're going to have to just account for the you're going to, you know, do, do the admin, but you're not going to have to purchase any new permits and su surrender them. There's sort of a trial phase. So if you think of it like that, then no, it's not going to make any difference. But if you view it as a tool to get, as I said, to get all of the member states to sign up to all the other stuff, then actually it might have a positive climate impact. Because if they would, uh, were only ever going to sign up to this if the CBAM was part of the package, then I don't know. I just think you have to take a bit of a sort of nuanced uh, approach to this and 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 put it within the broader understanding of EU uh, politics in general. Okay, cool. 
Um, maybe I can reflect that to Sarah then just, just quickly, because, I mean, you've spoken of your, um, your kind of uh, positivity about this climate innovation club. Um, I wonder if you're aware of, of, you know, the EU voices in that. Are, are they particularly keen on, on that as an alternative? I mean, we have the, the border measure that's on paper now, but um, I don't know, would, would, they, would they actually prefer taking this approach? It's a really good question. And I actually don't, I think it's probably one of the areas that need to be resolved uh, in this broader discussion, which is, I, I do think there's a gen, like, I do think there's a pool of people who see these border carbon adjustment me measures as potentially leading to Stefan's uh, uh, scenario number one, right? Which is, be, we're all so deeply afraid of these, you know, the, the sort of, you know, race to the bottom uh, tariff dynamic here that all of a sudden we, you know, have, you know, fully compliant systems and we sort of work this all out. And like, I'm just really deeply skeptical of that as an outcome because for, for a lot of reasons, one, it's super hard to do that, right? For all of the reasons that it's super hard to decarbonize these sectors, anyway, from a domestic standpoint, to working that out on a sort of global multilateral basis for all these sectors would be extremely difficult in, in when you look at what that would actually take in a, in a trade context, right? I, so I do think that there are people who are starting to say, well, hold on a minute, like how do you incentivize early movers and companies that are trying to do the right thing, the innovators, in terms of, piloting you know, new products and services or pledging to buy new products and services. And I think that they're probably the ones that are starting to say, how do you one, protect those industries and those markets so that they develop faster, so that we innovate faster, so they become a community of innovators without um, doing, I think, what, what is the, the undesirable thing, which is pushing away countries that are not part of that supply chain, that don't have you know, that um, those sort of deeply decarbonized um, energy sectors in their, their, their policy portfolios, their investment portfolios. And so I do think that proactively creating these on a sector by sector basis actually simplifies what we're about here, which is let's not say that this is forever, but let's think about this as a climate aligned trade regime that tries to incubate um, technologies that need incubation. And let's be as inclusive as possible about that. It's not frictionless, but I do think it is a, a, posi a plausible political pathway forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm starting to see how this stuff can be formed. Uh, an equally catchy name, though, is Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. We need to come up with some better names. Um, okay. We've got some questions coming in from Slido here. And actually, these, these are kind of focused on on the alternative, on, on the Climate Innovation Club. Uh, specifically, someone's asking, um, how would enforcement within the club-based approach work? I think you spoke a bit to that in your report, Stefan, and maybe you can clarify. So, yeah, again, we borrow um, from the Bill Nordhaus um, proposal or the idea that he put forth a couple of years ago for sort of a broader international cooperative um, club approach. And the idea was that you um, members uh, within the club, there'd be liberalized trade um, as long as they meet some criteria. Again, we sort of suggest a, a number of potential criteria that would be negotiated amongst the partners um, or the, the potential partners to this, to this club uh, for membership. Uh, and then enforcement would be if you are, if you're a nation that is initially outside the club and you don't want to face uh, potential reciprocal tariffs, flat tariffs or quotas on, on products, you'd have to show some kind of um, some kind of level of ambition equal to to the criteria that allows for uh, for the original member states um, in the club. Uh, we think that's at least flexible enough to allow for potentially allowing least developed nations or um, uh, again, respecting some of these principles around uh, common but differentiated responsibilities that we see as uh, potentially uh, fatal to to a, a CBAM proposal. Um, so so yeah, it would be essentially a, a self policing uh, a group a club where the 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 stick is is uh, is flat flat tariffs on on uh, industrial imports. 
Okay, okay. And in, in what you're saying, though, I mean, even just explaining your way around it, we, we seem to arrive at some of the difficulties that the CBAM is facing too, which is what Sam was talking to earlier, I think. Um, perhaps another a question here is, um, uh, oh, yeah. Um, do you think the policy directed at research sharing uh, would produce better climate-related results than CBAMs? And the examples given would be, uh, for instance, developing thin film uh, solar PV panels. Um, is this something that could, could give governments better bang from their climate policy book, guys? Does anyone want to answer that? I'm not sure if it's something that you've come across before. Um, research has been state-directed, I guess, and then certainly on the US front. Sarah, is that something you'd be involved with? Well, I'm just, I want to make sure I understand that question appropriately, right? So I do think that there is a lot of, um, where we do have collaboration on innovation is through uh, things like the Mission Possible Partnership or the Clean Energy Ministerial on a global basis that be, both try to sort of take a look at how we do innovation together well, right? But I think the difference here is um, it, this is not so much about just ensuring that we create new technologies or evolve new technologies on the same type of path that we have uh, historically. It's about doing it faster and accelerating the rate and pace at which it happens and those technologies make it into market. And so I think one of the big innovations over the last several years has been this appreciation that innovation is the full value chain of innovation all the way from creating things to piloting them to putting them out in the market. And I think that these types of trade arrangements and investments are now, you see this reflected in, uh, it's been reflected, quite frankly, for a longer period of time in the European context. You're seeing this reflected in current legislation on the Hill in the United States, where it's really not just about, you know, investing in R&D, it is about investing in the full value chain of what makes, you know, new technology is actually viable in a market. And so I do think that policy directed at sort of research and research sharing and those sharing mechanisms that we have on a global basis, a la Mission Innovation and Clean Energy Ministerial and others are very valuable. I think what we don't have is the market organization, uh, you know, on a global scale that, that sends the right signals to accelerate that system even faster. And so that's, I think that's sort of the, the difference between the two approaches. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's the fundamental difference between the two projects. Okay, yeah, nice one. Thank you for thank you for illustrating that. Um, well, we're almost out of time, guys. So um, I think we'll suggest if we just um, have a, a few brief closing reflections from each of you, um, um, maybe to to reflect on what we've uh, what we've learned today, and and whether this is going to be something we're we're talking much more about in the future. Um, Maureen, maybe I can start with you. Sure, thank you. So, you know, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an undying optimist always. I think that having this, uh, and, I, and I do actually commend the, the, the EU for, for, for throwing something out there for all of us to react to. I think that sooner or later, we're all going to have to answer these questions and we're going to have to answer them both nationally and um, on, a, on a global scale about how we're going to get to net zero and how we're going to create a, an economy that's decoupled from, from carbon um, that you know both serves us and also serves uh, you know international development goals. Uh, I think these are, are really hard on purpose. If, they, if this was easy, we would have solved it already. So um, again, it's just a real privilege to be here and um, I hope everyone, uh, we, we, we have a chance to keep talking. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Sam, is it long live the CBAM? Not necessarily. It might never actually come come come, come, come into place, right? I mean, there's lots of EU big initiatives that didn't. Think about the financial transaction tax. Where's that? Where's that now? But 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 I, I think it needs to be changed. I think it needs to be improved. But I do think it's probably going to come into force. Uh, in terms of alternatives, I I, I think uh, your critiques of it were perfectly valid, and I think that a carbon club type approach has some possibilities, but I do think you need to do a bit more thinking as to how that would work in practice, because actually many of the critiques you level at the CBAM would also apply to the Carbon Club. Uh, and in some events, say WTO legality, if you don't design it correctly, it could be even worse. Uh, in terms of just one, one extra point to conclude, on, on the narrow application to say steel or something, there is a part of me and the, you know, the sort of in, the liberal free trader that lies deep beneath. There's a part of me that goes, how much more protection does steel need? 
right? <laughs> there's, so, there's so much protection. There's tariffs everywhere. There's, there's the trade war tariffs, but there's all the anti-dumping tariffs. Surely they're protected enough. And I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> you never have too much steel protection. <laughs> Okay, um, Sarah, maybe just some closing reflections for you. Are we in for a, a very messy future as regarding these border measures? Yeah, probably uh, for a whole variety of reasons, CBAM simply being one of them. Um, if you look at the history of the clean energy space, we've had a lot of trade measures uh, that characterize its development. And so we need to think about what that's going to look like if we try to speed things up. I will say, I think you asked a great question, which is, are we making too much of this? And I think the answer is both yes and no. We are probably making too much of the specter of CBAM and the potential for, you know, trade wars sort of, you know, coming into fruition, because I do think, you know, policymakers do sort of adjust to those thoughts in those futures. And so that is likely to happen, particularly with some of these longer timeframes. But I do think we're not making enough of it in the sense that we should start to look as this proposal, you know, recommends at the opportunity that market creation and clubs can bring to the sectors that we need to move faster. And so if you look at the WTO and you look at some of the things that people are concerned about uh, in terms of WTO compliance, there are pathways you could pursue that would actually make, the, you would have to do them through the WTO, which I think is the, the big complication, that would actually give some direction to how these clubs could work in a very productive and proactive way. It's just uh, the reality is that the institutional mechanisms we have as a multilateral community are all very tired, uh, don't like taking on massive new overhauls. And uh, and I think that that, you know, leads, to, leads one to think that an incrementalist approach might um, be more um, uh, successful here. Okay, great. Um, Sam, I think that's you uh, just having to dash off to your meeting. You're, you must be very excited at the prospect of an in-person meeting, with your full suit on and everything. Well, enjoy your dash if you have to leave shortly. Thank you very much. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, I think uh, just uh, uh, some closing remarks from Stefan, uh, who initially initiated our discussion by uh, providing that very thought-provoking report. Stefan. Yeah, I don't want to um, take up uh, too much of people's times at the moment, but uh, thank you all for joining us. And um, I do encourage folks to check out the report and uh, remain engaged on in this discussion. I do think it is, uh, to uh, echo Sarah's point, it's it's sort of both big and little at the same time. And I think it, it will, you know, stay tuned, I would say, until I think COP26 in November. Um, you know, there's already these uh, uh, non-climate related trade issues that are really bubbling up between the US, the EU, Australia, UK, of course. Um, so China. Um, so I think trade will now really become a, a major climate issue in a way that um, perhaps the European Union, the US and other partners uh, didn't always uh, foresee. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for all everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. And uh, thank you, Ben. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.